Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the September edition of Beyond Black History Month. Uh, thank you all for giving us uh, an hour of your time in this, this busy September. There's lots going on, and that's a good thing. Uh, let me thank our education committee, particularly our chairs, uh, Linda and Jean Crump, and I'm going to hand this program off to the professionals. Thanks, Jean and Linda. That's Jean. Thank you, David. <clears throat> I want to introduce our committee, Ray and Fran Taylor, Paul Ruffin, David and Lois Wilkins. I don't see anyone else right now, but it's uh, Alvin Stout and Edna Shirell and Marion Ruffin. And our new intern. And our new intern, Lauren Black. I'd like to start the program by saying this is the September month. It's the Underground Railroad month. And we're going to do our topic today, Angola, the Underground Railroad South. And it will be presented by uh, Vicki Odom, Jason Brown, and Daphne Towns. Uh, I'll introduce Vicki Odom. Vicki Odom is the president and CEO of the Sarasota African American Cultural Coalition. Its goal is to open an art center and history museum. The precursor to the historic preservation pro project is Newtown Alive. The initiative traces the history of Newtown, one of Sarasota's oldest communities. Newtown Productions and uh, Vicki founded Looking for Angola, the project in 2004 to identify artifacts related to the 1800s Black Seminole settlement. At that, this time, I'll turn it over to Vicki Olin. All right. Thank you so much. Very much, Jean. Uh, this project came about when I was at a major uh, turning point in my life. I wasn't sure where I was to go or what to do after I left Channel 40. And for those of you who are new to Sarasota, um, I was a news reporter at the ABC uh, affiliate for many, many years. Um, we were in a lawsuit. We settled the lawsuit amicably and that caused my transition. Well, I worked in uh, the government TV station um, putting videos together and they were working on a video about Sarasota. I recognized that they did not have black presence uh, coming into Sarasota until the civil war. And I knew that there was black presence here long before the civil war in the 1800s, but I wasn't on that project. Anyway, circumstances led them to invite me to join that uh, team. I rewrote the script and in, rewrote, <laughs> and in rewriting that script, I think I rewrote the script for my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, because that story of Angola touched me. So we put it in that script. I developed um, a documentary short about it. And then we did some archeology span and launched the Looking for Angola project. Also, that project is what led me out of Sarasota because a man was becoming president of an HBCU in middle Georgia. And he invited me to join his leadership team. And I did. <laughs> uh, so I really want to introduce you to two people that are on our team. We have a cultural anthropologist, historians, and they always get a chance to speak, but we haven't heard very much from Jason Brown and Daphne Towns. And it, it, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, Jason. Jason says that he chased me down to find out more about this story. Uh, he had learned something about the uh, Angola festival that was going to go on. Well, we had done a lot of work on the Angola project. And I had always dreamed of having a festival, but I didn't know really how to put a festival together. And, you know, I just felt like that was someone else's, it would be someone else that would take 
the looking for Angola project to the next step. And that person that you're going to hear from is, uh, is Daphne. So uh, as I said, he tracked me down. We got to talking. I told him that Daphne was doing the, um, the festival. And then I'm really going to read a little of his bio and let him take it from there. And when he's done, then I will say a little bit about Daphne because she took us by storm. But anyway, Jason A. Brown Sr. Now he was retiring from the military when we first met. He is a cultural resources manager, researcher, lecturer, entrepreneur, and a retired Miller a member of the United States Air Force. He specializes in cultural property protection, maroon communities, southeastern U.S. and Caribbean archaeology, abandoned cemeteries, and prehistory Native American and African American pottery analysis. He is a descendant of the maroon heritage of Red Bay's Andrus Islands in the Bahamas, and I'm going to let him take this story away because you're going to see how the divine worked <laughs> to pull us all together for real. <laughs> oh, hello everyone. All right. Um, like Vicki said, my name is Jason Brown. And this is all a, a phenomenon of how I even came about doing this stuff. Uh, like I said, I, uh, I was in the military and I had, a, I had the blessing of having a commander who was understanding. While I was in the military, I began my study in becoming a cultural resource manager and began to really dabble um, and find out more. Um, I, my, my career pretty much started over in Mississippi, um, doing a lot of research over in Mississippi, um, specifically in the Natchez area. Um, one thing led to another and just, um, especially studying political science and studying a lot of history, things began to piggyback um, um, one after one and how everything, as far as with history, um, especially with African-Americans, how things begin to link. With that linkage, it eventually brought me back to around 1821 and what took place down in Florida in 1821. And I remember my grandfather, a descendant of a uh, the Red Bay community. His name is uh, Shadrach Lewis. May he rest in peace. Okay, uh, may he rest in peace. I'm sure if he was here today, he'll take over this whole thing. Uh, but uh, um, um, very competent, very competent man. Um, and the spirit of Red Bay's truly was in him. Uh, but I remember certain things that he would say. Oh, you know, we used to have land over in Bradenton area, things like that. You know, you know. Okay, okay granted, you know, you, you kind of just kind of listen to some of the oral history. And so I began to put all that oral history together. I, after he passed away, I began to put pieces together as to what he, as I began to research his life, uh, because I had the pleasure of doing his, whole, his obituary. And um, I did his eulogy. I had that, had that honor to do my grandfather's uh, eulogy. So, um, so with all that research, uh, all, the, all the breadcrumbs kept leading over to Red Bay's and in Bradenton. And so I began to reach out to Vicki because I, I started just um, searching the web and, and the video came up with Vicki uh, doing a lot of work and doing, doing interviews um, pertaining to the Bradenton area and the Manatee uh, community. So in, in speaking, her, speaking with her, she was explaining that they're trying to get a festival together. And lo and behold, she introduced me, she gave me the number um, to Daphne Towns. Come to, come to, Find out I'm talking with Daphne. Daphne and I were related. <laughs> in the midst of all this, Daphne is a Raleigh. And the Raleigh's and the Lewis's, and I tell you, they go hand in hand, you know. So she's related to me. And it was just a pleasure um, to uh, to meet, to actually meet my cousin and to be a part of what her vision, her and Vicky's vision were um was laid out. Um someone asked the question, what is Red Base? Red Base is a maroon community that, um, that uh, um, back in 1821, there was a raid conducted in the Bradenton area and the Maroons, uh, Maroons, they actually fled to Andros Island, which is the Northeast, excuse me, the Northwest point of Andros, 
uh, island in the Bahamas. And you will find there's a settlement there and remnants of a settlement there and also the descendants of those that are of, of Seminole and uh, African descent. All right, um, Vicki, I'm gonna turn I'll it back it. over to you. All right, you got it. And thank you so much. You've got, I can't wait till we can show some of those artifacts that you dug with Dr. Uzi oh. Baram. Yes. And yes. we can display them in mm -hmm. um, this house that we're going to have at the Leonard Reed house and have you come to Sarasota and talk yes. about more yes. about your ancestry. But let me share about Daphne. Gosh, I met her. She, we met at a Starbucks. Daphne, Daphne called me out of the blue. <laughs> I, I did not know her. And I guess, well, I'm gonna let her tell that story too. But anyway, turns out she was, she came here to the United States as a missionary and uh, somehow learned about the Angola project, learned about where we had done some archeology span and she was walking on that land. Certainly uh, we consider that land sacred uh, there in East Bradenton. I'm going to read a little bit her, about her bio. She took over the festival. I knew that she was more than equipped to do it because mm -hmm. she had contacts with uh, the people of Bahamas um, in the government. But anyway, Daphne is the president of Oak Tree Community Outreach. It's a nonprofit organization that promotes the culture, history, and folklore of Bradenton and believes in educating our residents, especially um, youth and children about the same. Daphne serves as the event director for the Back to Angola Festival. She came to the United States as a missionary from the Bahamas in 1992. At that time, she was accepted into the Christian Retreat School of Ministry in Bradenton. She received her minister's license in 1995, and in 1997, she received her ordination. Daphne, Daphne met Trudy Williams, of Reflections of Manatee, where we did the initial um, archeology span to find artifacts of Angola. Daphne, why don't you tell us how you came to do the festival and how you found out even about the Angola project? Well, um, like Vicki said, my name is Daphne Towns. I'm a descendant of Andrus Island. My mother was born and raised in Andrus Island, which they moved from Red Bay and went to a bigger part to start life. I was born in Nassau. I came to the United States winter of 92 as a missionary. When I said I was coming to the United States as a missionary, people told me United States don't need missionaries. <laughs> I said, well, I got to go where I'm called. And what, what led me to the United States, I had a vision of Florida. I didn't know where in Florida I was gonna go, but I had a text from Deuteronomy 33, 19 that says, and they will summon people to the mountain and there offer the sacrifice of righteousness. They will feast on the abundance of the seas and on treasures hidden in the sand. Hmm. Now, could I dream that? <laughs> I didn't even know that was in the Bible, but that's the text I was given. So I came to Florida looking for these hidden treasures in the sand as a missionary, went to the school of ministry, but was invited to the Manatee Mineral Springs by a dear friend who works at the Joy FM. And she said, I wanna go to this spring. Her name is Michelle Talon Swoski. And she knew that I did a lot of community outreach, prayer walks. And she said, I want you to go with me to a community that wants house free runaway slaves. And I was like, what, in Bradenton? <laughs> she said, yes. I said, you've got to be kidding. I've been in Bradenton by this time, almost 15, 16 years and never knew it. She took me to the Manatee Mineral Springs, which was in walking distance from my home. So I was actually able to walk there. And we got there and she told the story of the Maroons and how they lived there. Now this is someone from the Joy FM telling me this story. So my husband and I begin to walk the grounds and I'm like, oh my God, you can feel it's sacred grounds. Now coming from an African descent, I mean, we can step on any ground and tell where it is. 
sacred or whether it's evil. That's just a part of our genes. And I said, I can feel the sacredness on this land. And we begin to walk and read the literature that was mounted there. And my husband called me and said, wait a minute, come over here. This one is about you guys. I was like, ah, stop kidding. And he said, no, this is about Andrus, where your mom is from. I said, Andrus? And I walked over and I read the plaque and it talked about Red Bay Andrus. And I was like, oh, wow. You know, growing up as a child, you would hear the stories that, you know, we're the, you know, we used to be in Florida. We used to have land until we escaped, but you didn't know where this was. And how was it possible? The divine, the great one, whatever you know him as, will mm -hmm. lead me here. I'm from Nassau in the Bahamas. Our forefathers was here with eons of time when I wasn't even in existence. And how yeah. is it that I would be divinely brought back in walking distance from whence they once lived? Mm. Yeah. If this is not divine, somebody please tell me what it is. And so I begin to read it, read it, read it. And I said, oh my God, how, we need to do a festival. How is this history sitting here and nobody knows about it? You know, everything with us is festival. Put color on it, put music on it, put food, people will come. <laughs> <laughs> if you just put, write history and put it in a book, maybe people who like to read will read it. But one thing with us, my background, my culture, if you want to get somebody's attention about history, beat a goat skin drum, play some cowbells, and do some fried fish and conch salad, you got them. <laughs> and, I, and then I said, oh, how, who do I contact? And Trudy saw me walking on the fields and, and, and I met her. And then she said, but Vicki Oden got all of this started. I said, how do I find her? And we tracked Vicki down, like she said, in a Starbucks. And we're telling her how we're gonna do this festival. And she told us how this was always her vision to have a festival. And we said, well, we're gonna do it for you. I believe that everything in life is a relay. You do your part and somebody else will help you. And she did her part and I came along and I said, this cannot be on a park. And it was on a park that was not even well kept, nothing. And I called the city and I wanted to find out why was this land so unkept? It has so much risk history. When is the last time it has been mowed? And, and, I, and I just kept on them. I said, I have to have an event here. And they were like, you can't have an event here. This, this have to happen, that have to happen. And this was like a couple months away. And I'm like, wait a minute, you don't understand. I'm from the Bahamas and we can put on an event in 24 hours, okay? Now, I don't know how y'all do it in the United States. You need months, years, we, no, 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 no. The history is here. We don't need time to put on an event. We just need the people and people will come. Nonetheless to say, a dear friend of mine who works with the government was in Bradenton attending a religious festival which she's gonna be here on Friday attending that religious festival again. And I brought her to the park and brought her husband and I showed them the history and they said the same thing. They look at each other and they were like, we gotta take this to the government, we need a festival. And I said, okay. We presented it to the government. We presented it to the Ministry of Tourism. And they were like, okay, yeah, we're familiar with the story. We are familiar with the history. So then I said, I need to get to Red Bay. I need to get some people. I need to get my family. I need to get the descendants. We need to do a festival. So I took it upon myself, made several trips to Red Bay, made the connection, got the ancestors involved. And there was the first Back to Angola Festival. I mean, when my family members actually got on the grounds, they wept, they wept, you know? And I told them, I said, but look at the positive out of this. Somebody recorded it. We would have never found it if they didn't record it. If Vicky and Uzi and Trudy wow. those didn't record it, it would have still just been, well, we're from Florida. No, nope. we're in Florida, you don't know. But now here it is. And I, I literally lived in walking distance from the location. And I say, wow, this has to be divine. We did the first festival, people came, the government got involved, funded, sending the people here, 
Florida Humanitarian Grand Council got involved the second time around. And we were planning the third one and then COVID hit. <laughs> but right. we're gonna still do it. We're gonna still do it. I spoke with a lady at Florida Humanitarian Grand Council this past week and she said, well, let's extend your funding out till next year, March. So Vicky, we're gonna see if we can still do this. Okay. Oh, good. Yeah. I hope so. she, said, she said, you don't have to turn the funding in. Let's extend it to next year, March, and see what we can do. The descendants are ready. They're sitting on the edge of their seats. Okay, Sharona and all of them, they're ready to come back and make the Kung salad and the fried fish. And we, we figure, even though we're rejoicing, it's a sad moment. Mm -hmm. It's a sad moment what actually happened. Mm -hmm. But we say, you know what? We give thanks that there was somebody taught enough about what happened to record it. So it wasn't all lost. So, so to Vicky and Jason and Uzi and Trudy, we say, thank you. What if, what if Vicky, you had said, oh, they said it's a myth. I'm not gonna follow with it. It's probably just a myth. But the Holy One, I think on the inside of you. Yes. Say, no, you, you can't leave this alone. This is real. And the, and the generation to come needs to know this. Exactly. Yeah. And for that, I'm grateful. And I said, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for your, this group tonight for hosting us, that more people will get to know this story and realize that this is a reality. This mm -hmm. is not a myth. Mm -hmm. And let us do all we can do to keep it alive. So I'm excited. I'm waiting to do the next festival. The ancestors are waiting, Look, cheering us on in the heavenlies, I would say. Look at here, we got the descendants sitting on the edge of their seat. I talk to them every day on Zoom and they want to know when we're going to do the next, the next festival. Then I meet Jason Brown, calls me and we talk and we talk and I said, what? Standard Creek? We're related. <laughs> and found out, oh my God, my cousin drives all the way from Atlanta and, and when we meet, it's like, man, we grew up together, you know? You, you, you can feel the connection. You can, you can feel, feel the connection. connection. And Jason, me and Jason talked every day in the beginning, like every day, every day, every day, every day. And I say, man, we got to keep this alive. We got mm -hmm. our children's children need to know this. They need to know this. And so I, I went back to Red Bay several times. I went back to Andrews several times. And the government is willing now to get even more involved. Only because of the COVID numbers, you know, they don't want to travel and but we're believing the numbers are gonna go down and we're gonna be able to continue to keep this history alive because I believe more people is gonna come. More people is gonna yeah. come, Vicky. More people will know what would happen, where we're going from here. And the only way I know to bring people together is with some good music and food. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds real good to me, Daphne. We have a video. Yeah. Um, Jean is going to play and Jean I'm not certain how long of the um, video you're going to be able to play but um, why don't you let's uh, let's let's uh, roll it and uh, you can stop it at the appropriate place and then we'll come back on the other side and answer any questions that um, our uh, viewers might have. Um, I have a question Vicki do you think if we did about 20 minutes of it it would be enough and then we could stop for some Q and A so that people have a chance. Or should we do it shorter? If, if that, if that's, if that's the time that you have, fine. I have a feeling you're going to want to hear more about from I Jason and Daphne. I <laughs> mean, you know, I yeah. So whatever time you think is fine with me. Before we ask David to roll, I hope everybody who's on this Zoom understands the treasures of the three people who just spoke to us. Vicki, you started something, and Jason and Daphne, thank you. We are so blessed that we have you and we can move forward. I'm gonna turn it over to David and he's gonna share his screen and start the video. video. David, okay. uh, I'll be happy to. Vicki, you know the best parts of this video, so if you want me to advance to any point, just let me know. Oh boy, that's, I know it's tough. Throw it <laughs> hard. <laughs> mm. 
Volume good? My name is Vicki Oldham, and I founded the Looking for Angola Project. I started dabbling in history as a kid, and that interest in it followed me <laughs> until the point where I am today. But it was in 2002 that I was um, transitioning my life, and Sarasota County government was doing a documentary about the history of Sarasota. A script had already been written about the history of Sarasota. And I looked at it, they asked me to edit it. And I realized that they had, the writer, had black presence coming to this area during the Civil War. And I knew that there were black people here long before the Civil War, because when I had gotten out of film school, uh, I did a documentary short about the history of Black Sarasota, and I was able to find out about the Angola settlement. And so I interjected that story into the documentary about the history of Sarasota that the county was putting together. And of course, I had to corroborate the story with historians because they had not heard about it. Well, no wonder it's a little known uh, almost forgotten story. It's, it was considered a myth here in Manatee County. People didn't even believe that it was actually true that anything actually happened. And so I got involved and corroborated that story. We put a small piece of the story into that Sarasota County uh, government documentary, but that the messages in that story kept nudging me, kept nudging about people in transition, people seeking freedom, people uh, wanting to, to uh, control their own destiny. And so I talked with the people that were working on the Sarasota County government documentary. They told me about a grant. We submitted the grant and it was approved. And there we were off and running. And so when I come to this uh, ground, I think about the first survey that we did, which was across the street. I remember that day, it was so exciting. And there was a drumbeat of interest here in Manatee County, but still, but still um, there was reticence to embrace um, this story about the strength of this um, independent freedom seeking uh, community. It has been, uh, Yes, a research journey, but a spiritual journey too, to find um, this settlement and to tell uh, this story. We're here on the bank of the Manatee River, the south side of the Manatee River, river that at one point was known as the Oyster River because of the rich oyster beds on it. Thanks to research by Dewey Dye and Cantor Brown Jr., we know from archival sources that at one point there had been a maroon community here, a group of people who were seeking their freedom from enslavement by coming all the way down to what is the southern parts of Tampa Bay. Finding the actual location on this river was a challenge and the challenge was met by doing archeology. span We started doing the archeology span by testing the area and then doing underwater archeology. span and through some good techniques, we're able to find some traces of a community that we know of as Angola. This community started in the 1770s. It grew in size over the decades 
to by 1821, being at least 700 people living from the south side of the Manatee River all the way down to Sarasota Bay. That community was destroyed in 1821, just as Florida was being transferred from Spain to the United States. And to a great extent, the memory of Angola was erased in this area, but it wasn't totally erased. The pine tree behind me is about 80 years old, and it's probably a descendant of a pine tree that in 1841 marked this part of the river, where just a few a uh, dozen meters to my south is a spring, the Manatee Mineral Spring. In 1841, two Anglo-Americans, with the help of Cuban fishermen, came up the river, saw the lone pine, got off in this spot, moved up to that spring, and then went about a mile more where they saw fields, fields that had been abandoned 20 years earlier. They've been planted by these freedom-seeking people, these Maroons of Angola. And Josiah Gates and his brother-in-law claimed this land and started building a community here that ultimately became the village of Manatee. That village of Manatee grew and grew until it became part of the city of Bradenton. So this is a spot that starts our understanding of a part of history. The name we use is Angola. We don't know it from the descendants themselves. We see it in the archival record. When Spain transferred Florida to the United States, they had to reconcile two very different types of private property. And so the lawyers and Bob created a land commission and people living in Florida made claims to various lands. One of the claims by, was by brothers known as the Caldez brothers, who originally had been from Cuba, who'd been fishing on this coast, and they claimed land here, which they called Angola. That claim was rejected because they were not the landowners, but they were claiming land of the Maroons. And so we've used that term. The other name that's in that record is Sarasota. And Sarasota, as some of you might know, is unknown for its origins. I'm not sure when it started being used or where it came from, but when we started the project, the decision was let's focus on the name Angola, which is a West African term. It's not unusual. There's other Maroon communities, including most famous in Brazil, that's named Angola. And it seems to be about a type of community that's mobilized and ready to defend its freedom. When the historians found the few scraps of archival information, it laid out the views of those who had conquered this area. Thanks to the work of Dr. Rosin Howard, we have a tremendous amount of insight for the descendants who had escaped to the British Bahamas and been living on Andros Island since the 1820s. We have some sense from them of their sense of identity and their commitment to freedom. And so Angola is a term that becomes the name of the country in West Africa. And it seems to represent a sense of community and of freedom and liberty. And so on the shore of the Manatee River was a place of freedom, of liberty. And we're returning that name to this place through this project. So we had a real challenge in front of us to find the material evidence for Angola, right? So the historical record gave us a sense that there had been a community here, but that sense was somewhere on the Manatee River. And even that was contested because it was so vague. The maps until the 20th century are not well done, is the easiest way to say it. We knew that the area where the Braden River enters, the Oyster River, now known as the Manti River, was an important part of the Angola community. But that particular spot was taken over in the 1840s for a plantation big house. And then in the 1920s, tin can tourists came, and it's an area that's just overbuilt where there wasn't any potential to do any archaeology. So one of the best spots didn't have the potential because of development for archaeological excavations. The look, the search underwater in the river 
discovered that when the Army Corps of Engineers dredged the river in the 1890s, 1910s, they had done a really good job. The river was almost cleaned out in the bottom, so we weren't finding any clues there. We were incredibly fortunate that Reflections of Manatee, a nonprofit historical preservation organization run by Trudy Williams and Jeff Williams, had preserved the land around the Manatee Mineral Spring. They had a commitment to the history of the area and they wanted to know the full history. And Jeff and Trudy Williams invited Looking for Angola as a research project to excavate. We did some test excavations back in 2008, 2009, 2013, found evidence for the early 19th century occupation by the Maroons. And that's how we found it. The area that we're here right now is going to be part of Riverwalk, the uh, entertainment district that's already in the further west part of Bradenton. So it's going to come all the way here, and this is going to be a park. Because of the type of transformation of the land they have to do to make it a park, including creating lagoons because of rising sea levels and other concerns, the city of Bradenton funded excavations in January 2020 that allowed me to do even more exposure and we're still in the process of going through those materials. We're getting close, but we're almost there. And what we found and what I can share with you is our initial findings is we see the level, the layer, the landscape of the Maroons. This clearly was one of the areas for Angola, a community that spread from here all the way down to Sarasota Bay. So there's much more of Angola to still find, but the area here, we've already found some very good evidence. What we're dealing with is a time period in Spanish territory. So a lot of the terminology that we use in American English is actually cumbersome and sometimes not even appropriate. The term Black Seminole comes about during the Second Seminole War, 1835 to 1842, when the indigenous people and people of African heritage rose up against the slave regime. And the term was Seminoles for the indigenous people, black Seminoles for the people of African heritage. The people of Angola, where well, the community was destroyed in 1821, that predates it. Many of the people who were here had escaped after the destruction of Angola into the interior and they become black Seminoles. Right? So we have this sort of questions of when do we use particular terms and identities? And we always have to keep in mind, right? It's a very cool, pleasant, sunny day right now, but anyone who lives in Florida knows in the summer, this is pretty harsh. It's difficult environments. These were areas with a lot of danger, a lot of challenges. Uh, the people had escaped from plantations up in Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina. It's tremendous distance. Some were born in freedom here in Spanish La Florida. Again, under really difficult conditions. The identities were fluid. People were creating communities full of differences and making sense of them. The ones that escaped to the British Bahamas, living in Andros Island, Island. built new communities there. The ones who stay in Florida, again, create new identities and communities. We're trying to make sense of a time period from the 1770s to 1821 but we don't have the words of the people themselves, only the words of the US military that tried to destroy them. And so we're trying to tease through. And so my approach as an anthropologist is to allow that fluidity, right? And we have to think about if we use the number 700 for the number of people here, 700 different senses of who they are and how they told their children and grandchildren about what they did and how they did it. And we want to keep alive all that diversity as people are making choices of how to live in freedom with the active fear of destruction. So we want all that to come out, right? It's not a static moment, but a real dynamic moment and part of a longer history that becomes the story of the Black Seminoles, the Seminole tribe of Florida, the people of the Bahamas in lots of different ways. So much of the history was lost. Enslavement wasn't just about the brutality towards individuals, but the erasure of who people were as people. And there's a rich heritage for the Gullah Geechee to other peoples 
that this is part of. And the research is still ongoing to make those connections, to raise how much distance people traveled to stay together, to sustain their families, their identities, their sense of the future. And the Gullah are very much part of this and the multiple languages and multiple choices people are making is all part of what we see in what's now just an empty field, but at one point had been a vibrant community. One of the archeological challenges for finding Angola was that this was not an empty field throughout its history. The area that's right now under this cap is the spring itself, a fairly small spring, but a mineral spring that attracted people probably for thousands of years. We were not able during our excavations to find evidence of the Native Americans who were here, but we know from the 1930s, a local resident comment about a Native American mound that was near this spring. It was probably removed sometime in the 1930s for, for use as roadbed, which is something that occurred all around this area. The remains of the indigenous people erased and covered over with asphalt. But we have a sense that this spring was probably important for thousands of years. And we do honor the native peoples, the Seminole Miccosukee peoples and their ancestors for whom land we're standing on. The Maroons came, they came because the spring provided fresh water. It provided a place where they could watch the river to make sure that no uh, American forces would come after them. It provided a place that probably had spiritual significance as well. After the Maroons were gone because of destruction in 1821, Josiah Gates came, settled, and built what ultimately was the village of Manatee. Houses were built, there were stores, there were shops. What is so empty now was it's built again and again. The Curry family bought the land, used it, there was an apartment complex built, or started to be built in the mid 20th century. It was only in the late 20th century that it was made into a park, the Manatee Mineral Spring Park, first actually Indian Springs Park. Archaeologically, that means there was layers and layers of history. So we see on the surface here is the present day, soon to be turned into a park for a river walk. Under that is the mid 20th century remains, under that early 20th century, late 19th century, mid 19th century, and then only under that is the maroon level. And so in doing the excavations as part of the ethics of archeology, span we need to go through all that material. So in my first uh, work here, we did very small excavations. It was in January, 2020 that we were able to open up and we're going through the materials to ensure that, that all those histories are represented understood at the base is the maroon history and that sense of freedom seems to live on that so much of the work here became frankly lucky breaks we're lucky that reflections of manatee preserved this land and was committed to its history and to its archaeology we're lucky that the excavations that I did, the small scale excavations, found the right sort of evidence to make the case. We were lucky that Daphne Towns came, saw the sign, and engaged in festivals, the Back to Angola Festival, was bringing descendants here to celebrate which the local community embraced. That energy, that positive energy of heritage for this area, for the history by the Manatee Mineral Spring, led the city of Brainton to fund those excavations in January and the Division of Historical Resources for the state of Florida to fund the lab work. All of which is allowing us to tell the story of Angola as just one of many histories here, many layers right now deep underground, but hopefully still inspiring people. The tagline for many of their heritage interpretation signs you see for reflections of Manatee is the history of this region flows from this spring. And this spring seems to be a really important component, even though it's fairly small. It seems to really be a source of inspiration for people to come here, 
and to reflect on what kind of communities they want to build. And we know for the last several hundred years, they were to build successful communities. So what we are right now is uh, city land, uh, Manatee Mineral Spring Park. This area is going to be transformed into the Eastern Terminal for Riverwalk. So there will be, the spring will be uh, the uncapped. It's going to flow into a pond. They'll flow into lagoons to get to the Manatee River. There's going to be new historical signs based on my archaeological work and the historic research that's been done. There's going to be a place for people to sit, to play, and to enjoy. The archaeological research was able to pull out the evidence from the ground so that when they do that transformation, they're not destroying anything because they've already captured most of the information through archaeology. So this will be a place for people to come and both enjoy, but also to learn. And the landscape architects have been very sympathetic to the archaeology. They have been very supportive. They, they understand the significance of this history and are trying to represent it as best they can. This has been an incredible opportunity. Uh, I like to start it out. I was sitting in my office in, in, at New College of Florida when my phone rang and I picked up the phone and it was Vicki Oldham who asked to come and see me. I didn't know who she was, but she had my name. She came in and I often refer to her. She came in like a hurricane with this vision of finding the Maroon community. I knew about it from having read the couple of published articles about it. And we had an interesting moment. I understood all too well that people would not believe the story. They knew about it from having read the couple of published articles about it. And we had an interesting. David, thank you. I want to thank Vicki and Jason and Daphne for the contents of the video. And I'd like to include the full video on our filing with the Sala to see this uh, Black History Month and see the entirety of the uh, video. I think we'll like to open it for questions of Vicki and Jason and Daphne. And I think the first question is, what possessed you to take the time to research it and come up with a great video and a great pre-conclusion to the Angola project? And anyone can jump in. You're muted, Vicki. You, you're muted, Vicki. I'm sorry. This isn't the video that I uh, produced. I, I, I had $24,000 that the state of Florida um, awarded me when I wrote that first grant. And so that first grant included archaeology and a documentary short that I was able to add on to. This video is a recent video that um, attorneys and, and uh, uh, a group of lawyers got together and um, got this video funded. And I'm glad that they did it. But you know what, what possessed me to start it is that, as I said, when these stories um, take a hold of me, they really don't let me go. They don't let me sleep. And it's almost like you just got to do it or you're not going to sleep. <laughs> it is as simple as that. <laughs> You do, you know, so you start, you know, I, what I did was just started moving into action and then things started coming together. You start meeting people that are interested in, as well and start asking questions. And that's basically what I, what, um, what, what started it. But I think that I'd like to ask Jason, how did he feel when he was out there um, doing archaeology with Uzi knowing that his ancestors were you know a part of that history on that land um, thank you Vicki um the feeling that I felt was number one honored I was honored to be there on that sacred gown round and actually working that project and then there was another feeling the other feeling as if you had to lay a loved one to rest. Mm -hmm. You know, when you take that 
Yeah. When you have to lay a loved one to rest, there was a sense of mourning as I worked that property as well. That site. Um, and the role that got me there, which is miraculous. I would never thought that that day I would be actually working an archaeological site that involved my ancestors and the method in which they fled um, brought a very, very somber feeling um, in a sense. Um, so uh, I was honored to be able to do it. I didn't, because I didn't know anyone else who, who, who was able to work a archeological site of this significance um, of, that, that involved their ancestors. I don't know anyone else. So very privileged. Jason, were some of the artifacts you found connected to your family or something like that? Was there something personal you think? No, there was nothing. Uh, there was nothing exactly. Uh, it was just in general, knowing that the, the, uh, the cultural material that was left behind was associated mm -hmm. with the activities that were involved there. That's the most important thing. Um, it was just like the evidence of, of there, were, there were folks there. And at the layer in which we were, we were digging, which was between 60, 50 to 80 centimeters down in the soil, was the ideal layer of doing that time frame, and, and that's that's that was our indicator indicator that we were in the right um, zone uh, within the soil. Hmm. Daphne, with all with all that work, your component was to put together a festival highlighting the past and the present. Tell me about that. Well, yes, that was my job to bring this history alive. I felt like it has almost been forgotten in the community. When I shared it with people who was born and raised in Bradenton, I'm talking about educators who have retired from the educational system, said they never heard of it. It was never taught in their schools. It was like, what? What do you mean never taught in your schools? She said, never heard of it. And this lady is older than me, retired educator, Vicky. And she said, she never heard of it. I spoke with other teachers and they said they never heard of it. I said, well, and they started bringing the children over to the site even before I had the festival. I said, well, let's start doing community walks so the children could see, let, let's start it. If it's not in a book, at least let it get it in their head. Because let me tell you something, you could destroy a book, but you can't destroy what in my head. Mm -hmm. My mom always told us as children, mm -hmm. what you got in your head, nobody could take it away from you. It's called life. And so my job was to make sure this history is not forgotten. And like Vicky said, once it get a hold of you, you can't let it go. Mm -hmm. I was trying to get funding for the first festival. Nobody funded it. Other than Vicky gave me some of her personal money <laughs> and Jason gave me some of his personal money. And my husband said, well, we'll fund it out of our retirement, but this history must be known. Amen. And so that's my job to keep it alive. From generation to generation, I feel like this is a part of my mission coming here to America. And I have finally found the hidden treasures in the sand. How could I not do this? I got this text before I came here. I was here, what? My daughter is 26. So I've been here 27 years and only found it three years ago. So I got at least another 60 years to keep it alive. You know, my, my goal is I want to be here until I'm 120. So, and I'm only 60 now. So I got at least another hundred years to keep it alive. <laughs> and I'm going to do that with or without the funding of anyone. Because mm. I believe as a minister of the gospel, what the most high calls for, he provides for. Right. And so if I never get a sponsor, which I hope I do, somehow it's going to happen. It's going to happen. My family will come. They'll do the cooking. I have <laughs> relatives that are part of cultural groups. They'll come and they do the dancing. They're going to be here this week. So I, we'll get it done. We're going to not let this history be lost ever again. So it won't, it won't, it, it won't happen on my watch. It so won't happen on Vicky's watch. It won't happen on Uzi, Jason, and all of us that's connected with this it will remain alive. 
And I'm hoping once that park is finished, Vicki, we can have that festival on that park. So I have two questions. One, when will the park be finished? Because we were there with some people recently and everything's dug up, you know? So unfortunately we didn't call ahead of time and make sure the places where you could go through those three houses were open. But when do they anticipate the river walk being done? I don't have any dates. Do you, Vicki? I, I certainly um, can't answer it. See, this, the, um, so my role started a project. I, like you said, Daphne, I took it as far as I could. There's, there's a lot more that can be done there. But at this point, I've, uh, I pivoted to some other history in Sarasota, that new town alive. So I have, I don't know when that river walk, um, I'm sure Uzi would know, but he's Uzi not, uh, he he's not a part of us. I want to say something too. That uh, festival, Daphne brought um, the minister of tourism and he, ex we experienced a cultural immersion um, experience. He taught us dancing and he, he and folk dances and songs and the culture. And it was a whole lot of fun. And uh, I can't wait till you can um, do it again. And then you got the food, you've got the, the music uh, and the rush out. Yes. Ooh, the <laughs> rush out is so much fun. And that's my second question. Um, Daphne, you said it may happen in March. Do you know what part of March it may happen or is it definite for March? Well, we, we are hoping we can do it before, before March. That's our deadline. Okay. per se, but we don't have a date as yet. It's all depending on how high the COVID numbers are. Oh, if the numbers yes. are really high in the Bahamas, they're not going to travel. Right. They're not going to travel. And that's, that's the only thing that's holding us up. But now my cultural group who is here this week, they're to, they're to religious festival. They are more go get us. I might have to bring a different group. <laughs> they, they're more mission minded. They, they would go in the face of comeback. You know what I'm saying? Like when there's a war, they don't worry about it. Because we have 20 something of them coming this week for a religious festival. And they said, COVID or not, we're coming. We have been ordained and called to do this. So I may use that group because they are more daring. And so we're going to get it done. <laughs> but now we don't want to dominate the questions. I see the Taylors have a question. You're muted. OK. Uh, yes, uh, David Wilkins. Uh, can you possibly dig into the historical treasures of your mind? It seems like during one of your history uh, lessons, you mentioned that uh, Andrew Jackson was somehow involved in the destruction of the, of the village that the, that the slaves escaping southward instead of northward uh, were, were exposed to. Can you talk about that just a bit, if you can recall that? So, so really briefly, and I noticed Jason's head nodding, and 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 he he can uh, probably enhance whatever I can say. But that's right, Ray. Uh, mm -hmm. Andrew Jackson prided himself on being a, a, a white supremacist warrior uh, to clear as much land for uh, the so-called uh, New Americans, and that meant driving the indigenous people west and capturing as many enslaved. Uh, runaway enslaved people as he could to return them to slavery. And so he was notorious, he was noted, he ran for the presidency on the, the strength of uh, the viciousness of he and his soldiers' attacks on communities like, uh, like Angola. But Jason, go ahead. You probably got some insights as well. Thank you, David. Yeah. Jason, go ahead. Yes, uh, Andrew Jackson, known AKA as the Indian killer, that was his yeah. name. He felt that every uh, black person, every slave sh supposed to have an owner, whether you were freed or not, he felt that you should have white supervision. That was his, that's just the way he thought. So by Florida being a safe haven for runaways and Native Americans that did not go along with the status quo, he felt that it was a military threat and he treated it as such. So to understand his, his, his energy towards those raids is as if, I always say this, imagine law enforcement coming in, kicking the door to a drug house. All right, we understand it now, right? That was the same energy 
in which he uh, pursued that whole venue. So with that being said, you had Africans and Indians jumping out of the windows and spreading themselves every which way they could to get free. Um, to to uh, that way they would not be caught and brought into and brought into slavery. So we can it's safe to say that it was a massacre uh, incorporated with that raid uh, because a lot of people did not make it. A lot of people did not. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Are there closing awesome. remarks by Vicky? Hmm. I said, are there? I was going to say just what's amazing is that a remnant did keep running and ended up at Cape uh, Florida where Key Biscayne is mm -hmm. and crossed that Gulf Stream and ended up in um, Red Base, Andrews Island. Wow. Amazing. It took three days for them to cross that, three days in canoe, in canoe. Um, faster means were, were uh, tough, but it took three days. That's what they, 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 uh, they were willing to sacrifice as far as getting their freedom um, and trying to find a safe haven. It was just, it was, it was a very, very serious event for them. I appreciate that. Vicki, Jason, Daphne, are there any closing remarks before I close the Zoom? We're always thankful for the opportunity yes. to share important history. Yes. You all did an amazing job with this could have gone on for hours because <laughs> it was so fascinating. I hope we'll, we'll make sure that videos are attached but this yeah. will be available. So if you have people who couldn't come because of this time period that it's in, it will be on the Asala website for something that you can reference to and you can send out to others. And we'll make sure the videos are available for others. Vicky, we, go, go ahead. ahead. Vicky, if you could send the video that you're thinking of, we'll include that video with the one we presented today and David will attach it to the Zoom uh, for all of our members. Okay. All right. That was that was my inspirational video, Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Woo! Excellent. Thank you all very much. Well done. Thank you. I, I'd, thank like you. To thank, I'd like to thank Vicky and Jason and Daphne for an excellent participation. This has been the best Zoom of all of our Zooms until next October. Well, we have another Zoom. <laughs> Ray Taylor is going to do the Zoom on voting rights, and we look forward to the October Black History Month. And I think that's all that I would like to say. I appreciate everybody's indulgence from Asala to join the Zoom. I think we all learned more than we knew when we started the Zoom. And that's the purpose of Beyond Black History Month because we're not just te teaching black history in February. We're teaching history. That's it. Right. Yes. 365 yes. days of the year. Excellent. Yes. yes. And David, you can stop the recording anytime you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you.